You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 189. Today, I have a special guest, Will Overfelt, who is a friend of mine. He's been a seasoned BCBA for a number of years, and he works in North Carolina. He's a behavior specialist in schools. He provides behavior consultation for adults and occasionally teaches special education classes at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. He um, came on the podcast because he um, took my online verbal behavior bundle course, which I didn't even know he was taking, but he needed 32 learning CEUs, which he could get by taking the course. He took the course and he loved it and he wrote an excellent review. Let me just um, read you part of it. I'm going to give him a shout out here. He said, Mary made the course accessible, but still functional and rigorous. If you are a BCBA and want to enhance your practical verbal behavior skills, this is a great class. If you are a parent and just starting to get language or more complex communication, from your child, this course is worth your time. Super practical. Um, He also said it includes all the needed CEUs for a two-year cycle for behavior analyst professionals, and it would be life-changing information for parents of younger kids on the spectrum. So I saw that great review testimonial on Will's uh, Facebook page. I reached out to have him come on the show, talk about his expertise, um, talk about his, you know, work and also why and why he took the course and how he liked it, what surprised him. He also has a really interesting side um, passion, which we talk about near the end of the show. And Will has one of my very favorite answers at the very end of the show on um, self-care tips and stress management tools. So love this interview with Will Overfelt. Let's get to it now. Thank you so much, Will, for joining us today. Sure. I'm so glad to be here, Mary. Yeah. So we've been Facebook friends for a long time and... um, never met in person uh, at this point, but um, you had posted back in early June, this whole long uh, post on your, on your Facebook page, really touting the verbal behavior bundle course. And, um, and we're going to talk about that today as a seasoned professional, how you took the course, why you took it, what were your hesitations, all that stuff. But before we get into all that, we're also going to talk about what you do now as a seasoned behavior analyst and all kinds of good stuff. But before we get to that, tell me and our listeners uh, about your fall into the autism ABA world. Sure, sure. I think I fell into autism uh, the way a lot of other people do by accident, you know, aside from, uh, um, you know, if you have a, a family member. Um, but I was actually a, um, an, uh, doing my undergrad in um, international studies at uh, East Tennessee State um, and uh, did an uh, internship in Zimbabwe and uh, um, uh, spent the, the summer there and uh, uh, really realized that the, you know, the, you know, I'd signed up for the international studies degree because I was interested in third world stuff. And I got into it and realized that I probably really wasn't hardy enough to, you know, to, to, to live that third world life. But while I was there, I ended up working in a uh, village for uh, people with disabilities, um, very, you know, um, impoverished kind of, kind of, kind of village. But um, um, as I was there for the summer, I got really interested in that. And when I came back, when I, when I got back to the United States and realized you know, that I really needed to change some things up. I started taking some special ed classes and thought, well, this is, this is really interesting. And, uh, you know, kind of within my, with, you know, I ended up getting a minor in special ed um, from my undergrad and uh, um, finished up my undergrad and, you know, moved from Tennessee to North Carolina and um, actually to be an AmeriCorps volunteer where I worked with, uh, with people with disabilities and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of within uh, that had a, um, had, had a lot of um, had a lot of really good experiences. So neat. 
So I want to give a shout out to one of my best entrepreneurial friends, Tembi Becca, who is from Zimbabwe. Oh, wow. Um, cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, she's amazing. So that's kind of what I know about Zimbabwe. So you were there with AmeriCorps. No, I was actually there as a um, internship for okay. um, for um, okay. not for my undergrad at the time, and then um, when I graduated, um, didn't really know what to, to do with myself, and found AmeriCorps and oh, okay. um, moved to moved to North Carolina to be an AmeriCorps volunteer, and um, it was focused on disabilities. And I think the first or second um, individual that they put me with was somebody with autism, and yeah. uh, um, you know, I was I was hooked, you know, immediately. Yeah, wow. Was, this is this is this is really this is really interesting, and uh, you know, just ended up you know continuing to to work and ended up in a uh, um, a classroom um, work, working directly with a kid in a classroom, and the the uh, the teacher in that classroom said, you know, you would be a good special educator if you thought about you know getting your licensure, and our school at that time contracted with with Denny Reed. And um, so, you know, a year later, I, you know, was in a master's in special ed program, um, was given my own classroom, and Denny was my consultant, and he, uh, he helped, me, helped me to, to understand what ABA was, and um, then did my supervision. So, um, you know, it, all was, it was always almost like magical how things lined up. Yeah, so Dr. Dennis Reed, I've seen him present a few times. Yep. And he's a very good presenter. I would love to have him on the podcast at some point. But one of the things I want to tell my listeners, because, you know, everybody's tuning in for whatever reason, but it was like, my memory's not wonderful. But I remember one really great thing that he um, did in this key, keynote presentation is it was in um, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And he had everybody take two minutes and write down all the choices they made till they got there. Right. And so I wrote down, you know, what to wear, whether to have, you know, where to park, what, what to have for breakfast to wait until I got there to see if they had breakfast, what to have to drink. Um, you know, all those, where to sit at the Congress and just all of these things that happened before 9 a.m. when he did the, the workshop, the keynote. Sure. And, um, and he just illustrated throughout the whole talk about how choices really make us happy. Mm -hmm. And our kids with autism, our clients and our children um, really have a tough time making choices. Um, and you know that really stuck out. Sure, sure. I think I think the thing that that the the, the gift that Denny really gave me was the gift of a, a pragmatic view of of ABA. Um, um, Denny's just exceptionally pragmatic and uh, uh, really taught me how to how to talk to people and how to interact with people and how to you know how to write my reports in such a way that they were um, that they felt good to people and you know how how to use all of the ABA soft skills. Um, with the, the rest of the world, you know, we're not just using our, we're not just using our science with, uh, with children with autism. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It, it's how, it's how the world works. So. Yeah. Yeah. Really good stuff. So um, you became a BCABA in mm -hmm. 2006. And then a couple of years later, you became a BCBA. Correct. So I don't know that out of you know, we're on, you know, podcast number 189 at this point. I don't know if we've ever talked about a BCABA. So yeah. can you tell our listeners what a BCABA is and why? Sure, you sure. sure. And, yeah, and, and, you know, the, the, the board is still credentialing BCABAs as far as I know. Um, it's not an incredibly popular endorsement right now. You know, I, I, at the time, the BCABA existed before the RBT credential existed. So and BCABA stands for board. Sorry, they actually changed it. Started out as um, let's see, they changed it. it. Was board certified associate behavior analyst, um, and I think before that it had another. another they, they changed it over the years. The A had a had a different. Maybe assistant that. versus associate. Yeah, assistant, assistant versus yeah. associate. That's it. That's okay. it. Okay, so an associate is is the middle little A in. Yeah. ABA at this yeah. moment. And back when I became a BCBA, um, which required a master's degree, 
the BCABA required a bachelor's degree. Um, and I'm thinking that's still the case. I think so. I think so. Um, from, from, what I, from what I can tell, it just seems like uh, uh, pe people seem, seem to shy away from it because it seems like folks are either doing the RBT or doing, doing the, 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 the BCBA. Um, not exactly sh totally sure what, what that's about, except for, um, you know, with the RBT with 40 hours, you can jump in, you can jump into the field and start working. And so I think, you know, once people are kind of already in the field and they've already started, you know, they, they I think people are entering the field under the RBT credential right now. That's, that's what I see more, more often than, than not. People are getting their feet wet with, uh, with the RBT credential and um, that, go, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, so an RBT is a registered behavior technician, and that requires only a high school degree. Mm -hmm. And that is the person that can do 40 hours of training under the direction of a BCBA. They can begin working with kids. So parents that are listening may be interacting with RBTs in their home. And, and sure. if insurance is covering, which now all 50 states do um, cover ABA services in most cases, um, then they will require that RBT credential. And so like over the years, like I've been certified as a BCBA since 2003, Will's been certified as a BCABA and then a BCBA starting in 2006. So, but oh, since then things have really changed. Well, first of all, the field has exploded, right? Um, and I, my number, is a thousand something. So I was among the first 1200 um, behavior analysts around the, the country and the world. Okay. And, and at the time it didn't, it required some schooling, some distance learning schooling, but, um, and some supervision mentorship was allowed. But over the years that's gotten a lot tighter. And I think for BCABAs, that's one of the things that you need a lot of supervision, you need a lot of extra post baccalaureate schooling. Sure. So you might as well just get your master's and do the BCBA. Cause then as you're working as a BCABA in the past, you used to be able to work pretty freely. And now you really have to be under the direction of a BCBA. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, that may have been a little technical for the parents listening, but I think for professionals, um, it might be helpful because lots of things have changed over the years and mm -hmm. and there are there are still real issues with you know rbts i know in my online community where people take my course and then go into the community you know there's a lot of complaints like they just sent this bc this rbt this registered behavior tech you know um and she doesn't know what she's doing she's brand new like I don't like her. Well, you know what? She's brand new. Number right. one. <laughs> number two, you're in my course and community. You know, if she's there and she's pleasant, I would keep her. <laughs> <laughs> and I would pair myself with reinforcement with her. And I wouldn't expect really anything except for her to be pleasant and open to feedback. Mm -hmm. And I would work with her to implement the things, the strategies in my courses. Um, I would not be overly critical or expect really anything from new RBTs, but do you have a different philosophy, Will? Um, no, I'm, I, I, I agree with you. Um, and, and keep in mind, I live in a state, I live in North Carolina, and uh, we have, uh, you know, we are only this year getting licensure. We are not a, 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 a state where um, not, not a state where ABA has been well accepted over the years. We're just really now, uh, people are starting to, to realize that we're, that we're okay and that we're skilled and that we're competent and um, that, you know, if you have a child with autism that needs support, we are the, we're the best professional um, for, the, for, the, for the job. And, and, and most occasions, as long as, as, long as you're willing, I'm, I'm big on collaboration. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't like behavior analysts who think they're the way, the truth, and the life. Of, uh, of, um, of, of, of all things. We, we, do, we do good work and we do good things, um, but I, I really do strongly believe in, in collaboration with uh, um, uh, 
SLPs, uh, OTs, occupational therapists, PTs, the, the full the full game, and especially within within the, the the school system. The schools are really set up um, under the you know um, either the the multidisciplinary or the transdisciplinary model, where you know different people wear different hats within the the, the work that they do, and um, th that model has a lot of. Um, we don't do a lot of research on, on that model within our world, but if you go into, you know, the, um, the special education uh, literature, um, there's, a, there's a real strong um, evidence base for, for that kind of transdisciplinary collaborative models. Yeah, there's, and there's, and to also involve the parent in that multidisciplinary right. team, because um, they need to have an important seat at the table and yeah. the intervention. Yeah, totally agree with you on that. So you you talked about how um, you know we do good work and everything, but we have seen some pretty um, not so great ABA. And I know I did a podcast. We can link it in the show notes. This is podcast one eighty nine. Um, I can link it in the show notes, but it was like the four myths and truths about ABA, and there just does seem to be a lot of not so great, if I may say it, bad ABA going on. And um, I'm sure you've experienced it, but like, how can parents and professionals tell uh, good ABA from bad ABA? Um, I think there's, I think there's a, a certain things that certain, you know, um, you know, I don't have a list or anything, but I think there's some, some, some red flags and white flags, I guess that you can, that you can look for the, the, the good and the, and the bad. Um, I think it, 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 you know, I think for a parent, a lot of times it's going to be gut instinct. Uh, what is what does this feel like to you? What's this what what does this relationship feel like? And it is a relationship. You, you know, uh, particularly, you know, if you have a have a child with a with a more um, involved disability, and you've got you know the the, the BCBA and the RBTs in your home, um, you're going you're going to get to know these people really well. They're going to be um, in your home, in your kid's school, in your community life. Um, um, you know, I've had some families say that the, you know, the, the, the BCBA agency kind of becomes a, a, a family member um, because they are so, you know, um, engaged in the, in the, in the, in the work. Um, so yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think being positive, you know, is key, like being pleasant, being positive, um, and not just assessing the child and telling you exactly how it's going to go, but also right. assessing the family members sure. needs and their strengths and their hesitations and their um, need to, for involvement or their um, wanting to know more or, you know, I, I do see it now. I don't work one-to-one -one with kids, but I do see it in our online community where I think some BCBAs and RBTs, but more so the, the BCBAs can get threatened with an overly knowledgeable parent. Sure, sure. I've, I've seen that happen, happen, happen plenty of times. And um, for me, one, one, of the, one of the big red flags is if the, um, if the team comes into your, into your home and they, they try to take control of your, of your home and your life and your situation, and they start using a whole lot of clinical terminology. That's that's one of my my, my big pet peeves. Um, we 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 need to we need to talk to people like they're like they're people, and that they are, you know, in in a language that makes sense to make sense to me. Sometimes I feel like I see BCBs go into situations, and it's almost like they're using the language as a way to, you know, kind of get a one up on the on the relationship in terms of being the smartest, most competent person in the room. Um, but it doesn't matter if you're the most competent person in the room, if you're a butthole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, we've done a, I did an interview with Bridget Taylor on compassion, compassionate care. I did an interview with Jonathan Tarbox about how professionals can work with parents. So we can link those in the show notes as well. Yeah. But I think the number one thing is Everybody's positive with each other, delivering eight positives to every negative. If the child's screaming when the doorbell gets rung, you know, when the therapist comes, it, it doesn't mean you have to fire everybody. It just means that they're not doing the kind of ABA that Will and I would approve of. Right. And those individuals, that team, that 
organization really needs more training. So why don't we talk about the verbal behavior bundle and how Will needed credits and 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 what made you like how did you find it and what was your analysis of like should I take this or shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. um, well, I am um, notoriously bad for waiting uh, uh, too late to get my to get my CEU, so I did need a uh, a batch of CEUs. Um, I'm, I'm, it's one of my uh, uh, resolutions for for the coming year to 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 to, to spread my CEUs out and to to not wait. So, so, so uh, BCBAs every two years, BCBAs need to get uh, 32. thirty-two. Uh, they used to be called type two CEUs. Now they're called learning CEUs. So they need to get those CEUs under their belt every sure. two years. So the sure. bundle just by chance includes 32 learning CEUs, including four ethical CEUs. So you sure. came up, you came upon the need for CEUs and somehow you found out that my verbal behavior bundle included them. Well, I've had I've had a, like a like a like a little list of, of of trainings that I've wanted wanted to do um, for a while, and usually what I do when it's when it's time to do CEUs, I try to sit down and look at my um, deficits, what the, the things that I think that I'm not good at, the things okay. I want to be the things that I want to be better at as a as a clinician, and um, you know one of one of those things because uh, because here in North Carolina, um, the the type of ABA that I've ran has been more geared towards, because I worked in schools and schools aren't necessarily, um, we, we do provide, you know, um, ABA is a, you know, one, one of the methodologies, but, you know, schools are not generally going to do like a full ABA kind of, uh, kind of um, uh, program. And to be honest, I, I, nor, nor do I think they, nor do I think they should. Um, I really honestly prefer a little bit of a, of, um, of a mix there, but um um, because of that, I've never really, um, I felt like I never got fluent with the verbal behavior operants and, um, you know, I learned, you know, I learned those for my, um, for my uh, BCBA test and, you know, obviously, you know, um, I think everybody knows how to, you know, do a lot of man work and a lot of tagged work, but then when you really start looking at, you know, some of, some of the other, you know, more, I guess, advanced um, uh, verbal operants, um, it takes a lot of skill to, to, to run those. It takes a lot of, um, a lot of pre-planning. Um, it's not something that you can just kind of, you know, wing it. <laughs> you can't, you, you, you can't wing it. Um, so, um, I thought, you know, I really, I really need to get, to get, to get better at that. I need to, you know, that, that needs to be a real strong, uh, tool in my, my tool belt. And to be honest, I have, and this is this is no, um, 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 slap on Dr. Carbone. I'd been to a couple of his, um, um, some of his other trainings years and years ago. And to be honest, I just don't think I'm smart enough to under fully understand him. <laughs> uh, he, he always felt like he, he was just too, 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 too brilliant for me. And so, um, you know, well, I, we, I have a ton of training with Dr. Carbone because I was part, I was lead behavior analyst for the Pennsylvania Verbal Behavior Project uh -huh. from 2000 and Oh gosh, 2003 to 2010. And every year we went up once or twice to his clinic and we learned for two days at a shot, wow. you know, which was amazing, right? So I've been there, you know, eight or nine times for two days. And then the other great thing was I would come home and I would try stuff on Lucas. <laughs> Right. <laughs> After I'd come back. So it's not a matter of Dr. Carbone not being a good teacher or you not being okay. a good learner. Okay. It's a matter of you just didn't have that big of a that training that you could apply right away. Exactly. exactly. And we I also was in the verbal behavior project. I had a verbal behavior consultant starting in the year 2000 with Lucas. So like I knew the ables, I knew how to program from the, you know, like right away. But there's lots of people and you don't even need to learn that. Like my course isn't like you have to come out of it any certain way. It's right. just you realize, I think, when you take the course, how tricky, especially intermediate learners are, yeah. but also how tricky any learner is. And I, I also think my my experience as a parent, as an advocate and as a registered nurse, where I'm like constantly like, hey, 
I'm I'm pretty sure that's medically related and and yeah. just tying that all in throughout the course so sure 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 yeah so you it's, you, it's you just really just had it on the list you were considering your options and you decided to go for it we, but you were also hesitant that maybe it would be too basic right well i was, I was you know, a little bit i thought well this this is this is you know more geared towards parents it's it's it's, it's bundled towards parents but i thought well you know um if if she is able to to bring this down on a on a level that a parent without any um prior training and experience can really start implementing and that's what i wanted the the the, the, the quick and dirty work you know i wanted to be able to start implementing stuff quicker yeah. and um, and to be honest the the toddler course is really was created and is heavily marketed towards parents right but the verbal behavior bundle I first created starting in 2015. Mm -hmm. And originally it was called Autism ABA Help Online Training for Professionals and Gung Ho Parents. Right. So I wanted only the parents that were going to go to hear Carbone's lecture, only the parents who were going to be in the front row like I was. So it is a lot more technical and related to professionals than uh, probably my marketing is absolutely, absolutely. i thought i thought it was, it was i thought i thought it was very robust I thought it was very, very 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 robust um and and because it was quite a few hours it was you know i knew it was something that was going to give me some some fluency you know it wasn't going to be like a you know i think it i think it, I, I did the course over the, the course of like six or seven weeks so i was able to you know um um, set and do a little, set and do a little, set and do a little, and, you know, think about it and process it and um, think about how I would use it and then, and then come back to another, come back to another module. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what surprised you about it? Anything? I would just, I think, I think that it was, that it was, that it was robust, um, that it was, you know, not that your trainings wouldn't be robust, but since you're, you know, gearing it towards parents who don't have expertise, um, I, I felt like it was, you, you did it in such a way that it was, um, that it worked for me as a professional and that, and that it would work for a parent too. So, right, right. That's yeah, a, I've had really requests. Really threaded that needle. <laughs> yeah, I've had requests for, from people in the past that wanted me to come and do a lecture when I used to, you know, go around the world speaking on autism and they'd be like, okay, so in the morning you'll speak to the parents and then in the afternoon you'll speak to the professionals. I'm like, no, 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 I don't look like that. <laughs> because right. first of all, I'm there, I'm gonna say the same thing. You mm -hmm. might as well get me for the whole day talking to everybody because, um, we all need to work together. I'm both a parent and a professional. I don't think you can slice it out. Right. Um, and I like what you said. Well, like, you know, you, you took the course, like thinking, well, if I could explain it better to parents, like I love going to lectures about even basic VB or basic procedures, because it's like, I hear a different way. And one of the things that you probably well you definitely saw was my trainings are filled with videos of kids right right and that's the, i think that is that's the that's the kicker i'm like I, I needed to see that i needed i needed to see you i needed to see the cookie 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 <laughs> right and the intermediate learner course where no one really goes is you know how to teach prepositions how to teach pronouns, how to train somebody to teach pronouns and the mess that that entails right. and how to teach interverbal webbing, you know, and a lot of these procedures, uh, I mean, I've created some of them actually mm -hmm. from scratch, but a lot of them are adaptations of stuff I saw Dr. Carbone or Dr. Mark Sundberg doing in lectures that I couldn't rewind. I'd come home, try it with Lucas, try it with clients in the verbal behavior project, and then adapted um because it usually wouldn't work for lucas because he was not at the same level that the kids where he was doing it with were sure um, sure yeah so so now you feel more comfortable with um we also talk about the bb map and um how to do it how to program from it so absolutely absolutely and and i like that um that you you give access you give 
uh, registrants uh, access to the, to the course for a while. So, you know, if there's something, you know, next month that, you know, I'm working with a kid and think, well, I'd really like to go back and watch that video again. I know it's there. Yeah. And we usually, you know, we, we do recommend that people stay for a very, you know, low fee so that they can engage not only with the courses and 25 bonus videos, but also with the community. And um, I was telling Will before we hit record that in the coming months, I don't know what month, but I am going to be developing a train the trainer, a more, um, not a whole new course, but how to use this course quickly to, to become very fluent and trained in, in my approach, verbal behavior approach, turn autism around approach. They're all the same thing. Right. Um, it's, it's all just taking the science, making it super practical to help kids reach their fullest potential and increase talking, decrease tantrums, you know, but um, also not just language, work on eating, sleeping, potty training, going to the doctor's dentist, haircuts without a fuss. I mean, all of these things are so intertwined how to deal with medication trials and, and all these things, how to take data when, when you're, you know, the child or client is, is starting in the med or titrating a dose up. I mean, sure. these are things that we, as the interdisciplinary team and the experts on behavior should know and should right. be recommending absolutely. at least as an option. Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like <laughs> yay like made like breakneck speed in the last 10 or 15 years um and and we've done a lot of like the general aba stuff i feel like the vb's got to catch up vb's got to catch up to become a, a, a bigger part of the, of the of the general package um you know i did my super it's been a long time since i did my um uh, um um clinical hours or the, um, the, the coursework, the coursework. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I, I um, did it at FIT. It was great. That was, I had an amazing experience with my, my coursework at uh, Florida Tech. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would, I, I am guessing because it's been so long um, that the, the, those, those courses now probably um, have more, have more uh, of a, of a VB focus. So yeah. Yeah. All the, I think all the, all the training programs probably have more, more VB. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I know you've had my first book and look, you know, read my first book, Verbal yeah. Behavior Approach. Um, and that was published in 2007. And, and really that has done, I mean, it's selling better than ever and it has done so well. And I luckily wrote it very evergreen. So it's still a classic. There's nothing in there that's like, ooh, you know, I mean, I talk about the ables, which, you know, now I recommend, of course, the, the BB map, but it's, it's all, and, and my assessment, my plan, which are more basic, easier, um, but uh, it's all the kind of the same, and that, my first book is in, I think, 17 languages now. Oh, wow, wow. Um, so we did a, uh, a training for I think Lithuania, and we made that into a podcast. We can link that in the show notes for those of you that, like Will, have been in the field for, for over a decade and and really just uh, you know been around a long time. And and I agree, we need to make verbal behavior. You know, there's a lot of anti ABA people out there, yeah. and it's like we have to make sure the ABA that's being provided is quote unquote, good ABA and has a very robust verbal behavior uh, process going on. Like we're not with my 26 year old son, Lucas, we're not sitting down and doing mixed intensive teaching BB. Sure. But if, you know, his cousin has a girlfriend and they're, you know, they've been together for eight years and they are with us and he doesn't know her name, then I am going to kind of do Try. some fun little drills um, with her name and sure. I might get a picture, you know, if he's got a new staff member or a new procedure or um, we are using ABA and verbal behavior every day within his life. 
So this doesn't have to be like, oh, well, I don't need that because I'm not running intensive teaching. Right, right. Oh. Absolutely. My, my, my dog's going to have your dogs in the back, yep. um, which is totally fine. Okay, so I think that's great. And um, I would love to have you in our community long term. So we can definitely uh, talk <laughs> about that. And we have many professionals. We have professionals um, from over, well, parents and professionals from over 90 countries. We have people in in our community from, believe it or not, 2015. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it's not just a, oh, get in and get out, because we really want to change the way ABA is being offered. Um, sure, the world. sure, and, sure, um, sure. Yeah, so as we get closer to offering that train the trainer, professional training, or whatever we're going to call it or do, I would definitely uh, want to pick it up. Yeah. Okay, so I know you have, you are currently working in the field as a behavior analyst, but you also have some side interest. Uh, you're uh, working on a political campaign and you also are doing medical advocacy. Yeah. So why don't we talk about how your BCBA or how, let's talk about how you got into the whole medical advocacy and what is that? Sure, sure. Um, in 2020, right before COVID hit, um, my dad was, I got very, very ill and was in our, our local hospital. And we'd been there many, many, many times before, but the, the hospital had been sold to another, um, another company. Um, I won't say their name, um, very, the, the, but they were the largest um, um, hospital company in the country. And um, um, things, things changed, things changed in the, in the hospital. And um, I, I realized pretty quick that um, it wasn't safe to, to leave my, my family alone there. And uh, um, so I started, started a Facebook group to, to talk about healthcare issues in the region and to talk about things that were happening since the sale of our, since the sale of our hospital. And um, thinking that maybe I would, you know, it was something I'd never done before. It was outside of my uh, uh, expertise area. Um, but I, th I thought I'd get 10 or 15 people in the group and, you know, that it would be, uh, you know, a little, a little group that we talked to each other about. And then I realized that a lot of people were having the same feelings that I were about the kind of the loss of the innocence of the death of our, you know, community hospital. Um, and, um, you know, ended up with, uh, you know, over 13,000 members in the group now. And uh, I'm a plaintiff in a, in a lawsuit against some, some companies um, uh, based on uh, quali quality of, of care. And it's, it's really kind of become a, a, a second life in, in, in some ways. I will always do autism. I will always love autism. It will always be my primary work. Um, but I think what I realized is that some of, some of the skills that I learned as a BCBA um, even just some of the simple things of, of breaking down messaging into, into, into little points and, you know, know, knowing how to constantly reinforce the things that you want to see. Um, I realized that that, that was um, skills that transferred into communications work and into other, other advocacy work. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really turned into, um, to its own sort of um, unpaid uh, side, side profession, but, um, you know, it's, it's something that I, that I love and, um, that's something else that I'll tell younger, younger um, BCBAs and, and folks that are, um, you know, fairly new to the field. I, I teach some at one of the local universities for their in some of the special ed classes. And, you know, one of the things that I, I tell folks is that, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's, in kind of, it, it's okay to get yourself entrenched in this work and it's okay to, it's okay to love it, um, but you've got to have something else. You've got to have um, other things that you care about and you've got to have um, other other ways that you calm down and relax and you know, hobbies and uh, passions and personal interests um, I think it's I think it's really important to to, to, to find other other things um, so that you can stay so that you can stay fresh with with the, the, the work that you're doing you know for example you know I'm not doing uh, because I work for the school system I'm not doing a whole lot of work this summer around autism and I'm doing a lot of my advocacy work um, and you know I kind of walk away from you know the autism for a little bit during the summer but when I go back in the fall I'm refreshed and I'm, I'm there and I'm engaged with it um, rather than rather than being being burnout and I think this is a field that's very very easy to become burnout in 
Yeah, yeah. And you also um, are working on a political campaign. We won't say what party or right. who it is, I was, but... I was. It's 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 oh. been a step, but uh, um, it was a, a primary campaign, and I just I just really really enjoyed that work. And as uh, you know, the the thing that was interesting to me is you know we you know uh, worked on messaging and worked on uh, communications and worked on you know how to get people to come to events. It was all behavioral. It's yeah. all behavioral, and I can you know I was able to use some of my skills um, in right. that capacity. And they really really you, you you think they won't transfer, but they you know they really really will. Oh, they definitely do. I mean, people aren't going to show up unless there's reinforcement uh, in some capacity. So. Yeah. Um, you know, even for the parents listening out there, not just for the, prof I think that's spot on for professionals to, you know, uh, develop other interests and develop interests where you could use your talents and your skills to help um, in whatever you're passionate about and just be open to it. You know, like your dad got sick and, and you weren't thinking that, but just be open to, I mean, I've gotten myself into so many different alleys where I'm like, well, how did I get here? But let's go for it. Yeah. Um, but even parents, you know, you're overwhelmed with your child and everything, but you still, you also need some outlets and some yeah. passions that aren't necessarily 24 seven autism. Sure. Sure. But which, is a great lead into the final uh, question. You know, part of my podcast goals are not to just help the kids, but also help the parents and professionals be less stressed and lead happier lives. So do you have any, um, besides getting involved, you know, which we already cover, which I think is a great one, but do you have any stress reduction tips or self-care management tools that you use? You know, uh, uh... The, the first one of the first classes that I took in act kind of stuff yep. really taught me to think about how our own language and how language can be the cause of suffering in our in our in our lives um you know language is the cause of suffering and it causes our greatest you know ability to you know interact and communicate with people um but for for me um because so much of what I do is you know heavy autism work, communications work, language-based kind of stuff. I like, I like finding things that doesn't have a whole lot of language. I like, I like hanging out with my dog. I like hanging out with my mom bird. Um, I've got some possums on my porch that I feed um, that actually became during the, during the pandemic sort of became a little bit of like possum celebrity because I, I posted up on <laughs> possum. I do remember that yep. on it, fa Facebook, Will's personal page. Yep. Um, he started feeding possums, which totally freaked me out. I was like, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, <laughs> I am not a big animal. You know, I don't have pets and everything right. kind of freaks me out, but right. it is very entertaining. Like Will is, is kind of the possum whisperer. So <laughs> I just, yeah, during, during, during the, uh, during the pandemic, you know, when we were all kind of sitting at home and not working and I saw a possum come on the porch and I said, you know, I'm going to make it my mission. I'm going to pet that possum. <laughs> and I did. And then I got a webcam and I started, I made uh, possum masks for, for my, for my friends. And <laughs> um, you, you've got to, you've got to find other things that are joyful. That's. I love that. That's, yeah. that's like my favorite answer. This, you know, for as long as I can remember. Um, so I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Will. Thank you for um, joining my course, for yeah. being uh, so positive about it, being you know so public about it. It really will help others, other behavior analysts, other professionals, SLPs, RBTs, um, really think about the training. And, and yes, there is a fee. And I also provide lots of free information, low cost. You can get the book for free at the library, you know, like, if you're not ready to invest, um, but really in the end, it's not that much money, especially I like what you said about CEUs, like you have a list of skills that you want to get CEUs from. So like you want to get CEUs around. So like as a professional, don't just get CEUs that are not going to be helpful to you in the future. Right. So like that's, I think the whole, the whole episode was great in terms of lots of wisdom in here. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. It's a pleasure.